good morning, everybody, again. Good morning. It is such a beautiful morning here. Spring is making its second attempt. <laughs> the first attempt was very nice, and it was followed by 14 inches of snow. So now that snow is all gone, just within the last couple of days. And it's trying. Let me see if I can show you what it looks. Can you see here? Oh, it'll just be light. But I have the door of the cabin open. It's not terribly warm, but it's warm enough. I've got the door open, so getting the fresh air this morning. It's a pleasure. So I didn't know what I was going to talk about this morning, <clears throat> and which happens every once in a while. And when that happens, I, decide, I usually get a koan for inspiration. And so I picked up the Moomin Khan this morning and just randomly I said I'm going to open to a page at random and whatever koan I open to I'll talk about well the koan that I open to is the oak tree in the garden which of course is one of the more famous koans and it's one of my favorites and it's also a Chow Cho koan. And, and last week we talked about, about Chow Cho and his simplicity. And, and this koan is very simple in the tradition of Chow Cho. So the case is, a monk asked Joshua, Joshua is Chow Cho, that's his Japanese name. In all earnestness, what is the meaning of the patriarchs coming from the West? And Joshu said, the oak tree there in the garden. Again, a monk asked Joshu in all earnestness, what is the meaning of the patriarchs coming from the West? Joshu said, the oak tree there in the garden. We got the student asking this very sort of intellectual question. What is the meaning of the patriarchs coming from the West? Well, the patriarch that they're referring to in this case is Bodhidharma, right? Who we've talked about traveled from India to China at, at the ripe young age of 80, um, had his little confrontation with Emperor Wu, where, as we've talked about before, Wu thought that the way to be a good Buddhist was to build fancy temples, whereas Bodhidharma was committed to sitting, to zazen, to meditation, which he illustrated by going off into a cave for eight years and sitting in silent meditation, or at least that's what the, the myth tells us, or story tells us to make that point very clear. So, Chow Cho was certainly the descendant of Bodhidharma in the sense that he was not a man for many words. He never used a lot of words when a few could suffice. And in this case, he just pointed to the tree, to the oak tree. Sometimes it's translated as a cypress tree. Um, but th th that's of, of no consequence, um, except to the tree. Uh, but, you know, it, it, the, the simplest, sparsest answer, he points to it there. Interestingly enough, Years ago, I was trying to figure out how many years ago, I think at least 15, 
And uh, I don't know, Mary Jo, were you were you there when Peter Harris had Steph and Margaret come to give a talk at Colby? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out when that was. I think it was about fifteen years. It was. I wasn't a teacher yet, and I've been a teacher fourteen years, so it's at least fifteen. And anyway, so 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 Peter Harris arranged for Steph and Margaret to give a, a talk that it was uh, students at Colby that were in several, several different advanced English courses, poetry courses, and so on. Um, and, and for them to come. So what Steph and Margaret did was they gave the Colby students this koan. Everybody got a little slip of, little slip of paper with this koan on it. And, they asked them to to sit with it for a little while, which they did. And then they asked them to present their responses to the koan. And I was astonished because probably half the students gave responses that were credible enough that they might have passed. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, they had they had, they had a wonderful intuitive connection to this go on <clears throat> and, and in a sense it is a very very intuitive go on so what's it pointing to <clears throat> well fundamentally it's pointing to the interconnection, the non-separation of all things, right? That tree in the garden does not stand alone. It is an expression of the entire universe. It is connected to everything in the entire universe. And there's a couple of different ways of understanding that. There's the way that Titnahan explains it which I think is useful, you know, where because he'll, he talks about all the biological connections, you know, and this, the fact that this tree needs sun, it needs rain, it needs soil, earth, it needs other plants, and so on and so forth. And if you build that out, you eventually connect to the entire universe. So there's that sort of literal biological sense in which all things are connected. But there's the deeper sense, which is that separation itself is an illusion, that all things are connected <laughs> inherently. And the separation is something that we ourselves create with our minds, with our intellects. So this wonderful tree standing there in the garden is an expression of the entire universe. Just as everything else is. It's not unique in that way. There's nothing special about the tree. Everything in the universe is connected to everything else. So Chaltra, with this single phrase, conveys the entire dharma. The entire root of our practice, of our understanding. And yet, a lot has changed since I first started to sit with this koan and talk about it. Among other things, this, this tree is now in danger. It's been standing there in that garden for a thousand years, but now it's suddenly in danger. As are all the trees.
used to be that they could stand there unmolested. They could live out their lives and fulfill their existence as part of the continuum of everything that surrounds them. Now their existence is threatened. I spent a couple of hours yesterday starting to clean up some of the debris from the storms this winter. Just heartbreaking. The, the tree I started cutting was a massive, massive hemlock. I don't know, 80 feet tall, maybe. A, a, big, a big hemlock. And when it came down, it took down three or four trees around it. Just snapped off. This was in the, one of the late storms, one of the storms in the last month or so. And the power of a storm that can snap a hemlock, you know, that's the width of it at the base is more than I'm able to show you with my hands. Is is both terrifying and awe inspiring. But I've got dozens of trees on the property here that came down this winter. Um, many of which I won't ever do anything about, um, but some I need to, and this hemlock is one that I need to. So th this mighty hemlock, just like that um, oak tree in the garden. is under threat. You know, we're starting to see the first evidence of a new succession of species here in Maine. So that the more northern species, the spruce fir species of the boreal forest, are losing ground very fast. They were most of the trees that came down this winter. And they will be replaced, hope, hopefully, by other things if the other trees can get established. You know, um, oak trees are coming north. I have some oak seedlings on my property. Never had oaks before. Um, you know, so that, that species is a more southern species than the boreal forest species. But to me, it remains to be seen whether large oaks are going to be able to get established. I mean, you know, oak trees are very strong. They have a deep taproot. They can withstand a lot, but they have to get there first. They have to be able to grow so lots of change going on here in the garden. Not the same oak tree that I met when I, again, started to sit with this koan, however long ago that was, 20 years or whatever. Not the same conditions. And certainly not the same as it was in Chaucho's time. You know, there's a place that I love not too far from here uh, called Sear, Sears Island. Do some folks know Sears Island? It's not wi wi widely known outside of this area. But it has the distinction of being, let's see if I can say this right, the largest island on the east coast of the U.S., that's connected to the mainland by a causeway. So you can drive out to the island, but you cannot drive on the island. The island, I think it's about 900 acres. And, and <clears throat> there's, no, there's no, well, there's no active roads on the island. And 
I love it there. I, I don't exactly know why I love it as much as I do. I mean, you can walk around the shoreline. It's it's in Penobscot Bay. You can walk around. You can you know see the the bay and 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 that. And there's some wooded trails and there's some big beautiful trees. Talk about the oak tree in the garden. Ah, oh, I've got some photos of some of the of the magnificent oak trees that that live on that island. And also, there's some some ruins of the old human settlements that you know. Uh, it, well, it goes back to the Wabanaki. The Wabanaki used to visit the island frequently, and some are on the island, and you know, fish and clams and so on, and and, and subsist there. And then, if in in the colonial period, it became a farm or farms, and you can still see the stone walls. From those from those colonial farms, I don't know why, but that just moves me a lot when I go there. And and even on the busiest sort of summer day, you can find some places, trails back in the woods and so on, where where nobody's walking. It's kind of nice. Well, for some reason, a succession of Maine governors, back to at least John Baldacci has felt that Sears Island should be developed. This appears to be a burr under the saddle of our governors, that the fact that we have such a large, undeveloped chunk of land on the coast is, is just should not be allowed. So one governor after another has come up with a reason to develop the island. Uh, the last plan was a was an LNG port um, for for landing the liquid propane. That was one of the you know. But then they they got it almost, or they may have it. They said we're going to make it a port to service offshore wind power. What could be greener than that? We're going to develop this pristine island for the place to assemble the wind, the, the turbines, and take them out on the ocean. Now, now mind you, just across the way, in, in sight of the island, is another port point called Mac Point, which is industrial, which could be developed further with no loss of beautiful and wild spaces. And in fact, the Sierra Club, the Friends of Sears Island and others have tried to point that out repeatedly. Why aren't you over at Mac Point? Nobody's going to be upset. Here at, at Sears Island, everybody's upset. Well, this week, the legislature just agreed and blocked the, the destruction of the sand dunes on Sears Island, which is a really gives me, it makes me feel very, very good. Um, I had already kind of said farewell to the island when the, the governor put her full backing behind, behind its development. But Sears Island has some beautiful, beautiful oak trees, ancient, old oak trees. If you ever have the opportunity to get out there. So the condition of the oak tree in the garden has changed and is changing. It's not static. It's not the same tree that I met when I started working on this koan. And it's certainly not the same tree that Chow Cho met in the garden of his little monastery in China.
You know, and I don't know how to live anymore without facing these sorts of realities. To, to me, they're omnipresent. They're pervasive. Yesterday I heard one of the prominent AI experts being interviewed on public radio. I've been avoiding, I've been avoiding the news. I've been really well for two weeks. And so I put it on yesterday and they were interviewing this guy and they sort of got my imagination. So I listened to the interview. Okay, and, and so the, the summary is that in this guy's estimation, in four years, AI is going to reach a, an irreversible point. And we don't at this point know whether that irreversible point will be tantamount to the destruction of humanity. In four years. We don't know that it's going to, but we don't know that it's not. And apparently all the prominent AI experts are now sort of in chorus about this. You know, we've got to put the guardrails in place. We've got to put the guardrails in place. We just can't keep going forward, oblivious to the potential downsides. And yet, to a great extent, that's what we're doing. We're going forward without the guardrails. And this technology is evolving so fast that a major evolutionary step will be reached in another four years. This is not the world of Chow Cho's garden. I, I don't, I some really don't know how to wrap my mind around it. And it's spring, and it's beautiful, and the sun is shining. You know, yesterday, I had a eco-spiritual retreat scheduled for this weekend. And I had some people who had signed up and paid money and all that, ready to go. And on Friday night, we checked the weather. And the weather for Saturday morning was cold, damp rain. And if you've been in the woods at all lately in Maine, the woods are soaked. <clears throat> They're just as wet and saturated with water as they can possibly be. So I said, okay, I just don't see the point in taking these people out where it's supposed to be raining all night, raining in the morning and so on. And and, and um, I, I don't. They they were pretty game, I must say. They were pretty courageous, but I just couldn't see them having a good experience. And I and I have and I define that pretty broadly. Well, so then we woke up yesterday morning and it was beautiful and sunny, blue skies. <laughs> I had already canceled the the event. So we can be surprised also. We can have good surprises. And it is spring, and the sun is shining today. Willie went out on the porch while we were while I was sitting here, and and he he came back in and he he, he you know he's brown and his fur is dark and he was hot, <laughs> could touch his fur it was hot so he had been just loving it out there in the in the sun. So these contradictions exist.
th these rapid changes that are almost beyond our comprehension exist. Beautiful spring mornings exist. Whole jumble exists simultaneously. Beautiful oak trees have a governor who wants to industrialize their habitat. How do we hold on to all these realities? How do we find a path of sanity and healing and supporting others in the midst of this? There are certainly times and days when I am truly at a loss. Truly at a loss. Newman's commentary on Chaucho's koan. If you see through Joshu's response clearly, there is no Shakyamuni in the past, no Maitreya in the future. Lumon's commentary being equally terse <laughs> as is as is the uh, Joshu's koan. If you see through Joshu's response clearly, there is no Shakyamuni in the past, no Maitreya in the future. What's he saying? There's just this right now. There is no past. There is no future. Those do not exist. There is only this present moment. Only this present moment. The question is, how will we use it? Thank you. Um, Peter, I attended uh, an Ali class recently uh, put on by the World Affairs Council, and uh, the topic for the week was uh, green energy and what's being developed and what the future of green energy will be. And the presenter went through all sorts of uh, different uh, wind and solar and thermal and all, all these different possibilities and talked about how, well, China is getting ahead of us on developing the solar panels and uh, they need certain minerals that come from Africa and so they're down mining things and how that mining goes in Africa is was questionable and for each of these different types of green energy for the future uh, every one of them was 
in a sense, hopeful, and in another sense, just wrapped up in complexity of uh, more money to develop, more resources to use. And, and it's a very complex network because there's a lot of money in it. And at the end of the class, I said, we've heard about all of these ways to generate more energy in the future, green energy. Is there anything, any group that is working to conserve so that we don't use as much energy? And the presenter said, well, no, there really isn't. Which uh, I thought was, was most interesting that, that we're so invested in, you know, we can't do without this energy that we have gotten used to using. And uh, so we need more and more rather than, mm, maybe we need to not be so comfortable about whatever. So, um, so that was kind of an interesting class for that. And as you were talking about the koan and the fact that uh, Chow Cho pointed to the tree as non-separation, so I let go of our uh, impressions and judgments and thoughts and just just be the tree, just be there with the tree. Um, so if Chow Cho's tree was uh, blown down in, in the wind and had been taken away, uh, might, might he have said, uh, when he was asked the question, uh, coming from the West, uh, might he have said, the rock that's here where the tree used to be? So is it, does the koan also point to us needing to, uh, as you were saying, hold that, yeah, it's sad that certain things are going, but here we are and it's a spring morning and maybe there's a rock on the ground and so to be connected rather or rather than a state of non-separation um, be with what we have I think that's a question <laughs> you know I every scientist Every engineer, every tech giant should have to sit with this koan. You know, if you want solar panels here, that means somebody in Africa is going to need to mine the cobalt. And there's going to, you know, and there's going to be tailings from those cobalt mines that are going to pollute the landscape there. And the lungs of those people are going to be destroyed while they're doing that, and so on and so forth. So, you know, in, in a certain sense, these are illustrate, you know, painful illustrations of one body. We cannot move things one place and not expect things everywhere. You know, they, they used to be, uh, what's, his, what's his name? Uh, John Bradshaw. People remember John Bradshaw. He was the men go out in the woods and beat drums guy among other things um and, and family dynamics was his one of his primary subjects of interest and he used to talk about the family in terms of a mobile right and because the, that you cannot move one part of the mobile without the entire mobile moving and 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 so that in terms of the context of the family family systems theory uh, that was kind of a good illustration well it's a good illustration of planetary systems you cannot move any piece without moving every piece 
again, this is the thing that Buddhists have been saying for hundreds of years. It's all connected. And again, you know, this should be a, <laughs> my view of things, a fundamental teaching. You want to be a scientist? You want to be an engineer? You want to have a tech company? You need to understand this. When you move something, everything moves. So you better be prepared for that. You better anticipate that, and, you know, and and so on and so forth. And 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 yes, the, to your point, Susan. Also, I mean, this is one of my huge frustrations. We're skipping like a whole lot here. You know, we've totally abandoned you know conservation or you know reduction of our energy demand because we've we've gone. We have the technological salvation hypothesis, which says that. You know, at some point, technology is going to save us so we don't have to worry. Um, and, you know, technology is doing such a good job thus far that it seems to me a perfectly reasonable conclusion. Um, but but we, we have, but that's, but we like that because that gets us, takes away all the responsibility. That part of this discussion yesterday, this guy was saying, well, AI is going to solve fusion in a very few years. So we're going to have practical fusion energy available. Well, who knows whether that's true or not. But that's the kind of thinking that we're doing. We're going to leave it out and say, oh, we don't have to worry now because we're going to have fusion in a few years. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a little bit kind of messianic in a, in a certain way. Um, you know, I don't really have solid thoughts together on this, but change is inevitable. That oak tree is going to change. All of the trees are going to change. We're going to change. And then where do we stand with that? Because we know the best would be a balance, being able to keep our balance. That on one hand, and then affecting change for the benefit of all. How do you hold both of those? Change is absolutely inevitable. Right, that's it's like a law of the universe. It is a law of the universe. It, nothing is nothing is constant. Nothing is unchanging. Everything changes, and and to to imagine otherwise is unrealistic. We do that periodically too. We decide that we can sort of hold hold the dam back, you know, and and we find out it's not the case. The question is not whether change happens, but to what extent, what is the form of the change? Then what is our influence, ability to influence that one way or another? If a giant asteroid comes hurtling to Earth, change is going to happen, and we have no ability to control that change, right? That's going to, you know, we think that was how the dinosaurs bought it, although that's, I guess that's being questioned now. But that kind of idea, huge, we can't control. Massive catastrophes can happen. Um, you know, we can't control them. Minor catastrophes can happen, we can't control them. But there is a zone in which we have some discretion and we have some control. And I think the question constantly is how well do we use that?
Hey, Peter, I'm wondering, like, kind of have the same thought that Mary Jo has a little bit in that, how, how do I phrase this? How, how big do you have your thinking get in things like this? Because when you read the koan, my initial reaction to the koan was like, the answer to me was like, there is no meaning, right? Like, what's the meaning of Shakyamuni Buddha coming from the West? There, there's no meaning. So just go enjoy the oak tree. That's kind of my, was my response uh, or my take from it. And that, that was satisfying to me. I'm not saying it's right or not, but I'm just saying it was satisfying to me because it was small. You know what I mean? Because when things get too big, we get too big in our actions. I feel like um, that's when you become ideological ideology has a life of its own you're picking winners and losers you know i don't know if you know where i'm going with this whole thing but uh, i think it's very similar to what we just heard so i'm just i'm wondering you know like how how evangelical do we get about about this this stuff does that make sense what i'm asking yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I, I just think you're asking the wrong question. The question is, how evangelical do you get about this stuff? Mm, okay. You, you know, I mean, I I, I think we're, we all have to deal with this in our own way. We all have to take our own stand or not stand. Um, you know, but the, the, the problem is that there's a way in which Zen can descend into nihilism. Yes. You know, and 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 to sort of a, a, you know a, a quietistic you know th this is why the Chinese don't dislike Zen while they dislike Taoism, <laughs> and because the Taoists have a history of intervening periodically in the political affairs of the country when things get really terrible, whereas the Buddhists don't. They sit and they meditate and. You know, whatever comes and whatever goes on, they sit and they meditate. No threat to the established order. No threat to the communist, fascist regime in China. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Again, that's I think that's for each of us to, to wrestle with and come to terms with. You know, but that's the... <clears throat> That that's to me at least is the sort of the danger of where we can go. We can sit through anything. We can tolerate anything, but is that what we want to do? Is that fulfilling our bodhisattva vows to save all beings? But it's it's so it's so highly personal. My view. You know, my answer is my answer. Your answer is your answer. One of us is not right and one of us wrong. I, I think the thing that Zen says is wrestle with it. Be uncomfortable. <laughs> and what, then when we come up with an answer, it's the best we, you know, we can come. It's like the precepts, right? The, the, we cannot keep the precepts perfectly. We blow it all the time. But if we're wrestling with the precepts, if we're aware of the precepts, if we're trying to keep the precepts, then we're fulfilling our responsibility to the precepts. Not by perfection, but by awareness and effort. You know, it's all different. I just read a thing from Joanna Macy. We talked about the fact that she became a vegan years ago because she kind of connected with the horror of the killing of the animals. Mm. That's her decision. It's not, I'm still eating meat. That's, you know, and, and, and maybe I shouldn't be. I, I revisit it periodically. 
you know, yes, animals are dying. Plants are dying. Everything kills to survive. So, how do, you know, again, there's, there are no clear right or wrong answers. To, to me, the answer is have we struggled with it? Have we taken some time to carefully consider our position? And is that the best decision we can make right now? And if it is, then we live with it. As you were talking, Peter, I uh, I jotted down three things, and I, I'm rethinking it now in in uh, light of what you've just said. So I think this may be really ruminations on my own struggle with this. Um, somewhat philosophical, but it, but that doesn't mean it's not you know that it's not removed. It's really very present. Um, one of the things that is. Uh, an old chestnut about philosophy, and this has to do with existentialism, and you may have heard this phrase before, and it sounds very facile as a phrase, but but uh, it, I weighed in it quite often, and the, and, the, and the phrase was, as you many may know here, does existence precede essence? And it seems like so much of Buddhism is connecting with an essence that's beyond us, uh, us meaning this kind of awareness of our awareness of our awareness, I suppose, that the essence exists before us. Um, but it's a it's a rather frightening question that when we perish, so does essence. And we don't want that. You know, we we want by progeny and by the evolution, by the continuation of life, we want that to carry essence. But philosophically, if you think that essence is does precede us, and, and in a way, that makes sense to me. Um, um, maybe it's just a separation out of the ego, I don't know. But it, it brings me back to the point about the about uh, fundamentally holding on to life and the beauty of life, and does that really make a difference? And so in wrestling with this, obviously, I think it does. Um, and the second point is, I, th I think about uh, an artist, I don't know if I've said this here before, but an artist is going to go out and do a landscape and goes out and pre prepares his palette, and, you know, her palette, gets it all ready to go, and then and then goes out and puts the easel up and then paints uh, a rack of solar panels. I mean, that that's funny, and in a way it's not funny at all. It's what's happening to Sears Island, perhaps. Where do we get our, where do we feed? Um, the these where do we where does our soul get the the, the rich soil um and so the, it's a kind of a desperation to try to preserve that and and being active in that is also the preservation of life there's an old old saying of old romantic saying in the deepest sense of romanticism pluck a flower and disturb a star i love that phrase um uh, to think of the interconnectedness with life but it but it comes around full circle with the celebration of life. Um, and um, I don't want to use the word, but it comes to mind a bit of a desperation to do exactly that, to preserve life. And uh, uh, and um, I guess I'll end there. But such is my struggle with these things. Thank you, Cal. I think what you just said at the end of your your, your um, statement there is really, the, to me, the essence, the, your struggle with these things. I think we have to struggle with these things. You know, we have other alternatives. We can put needles in our arm. Many people are choosing to do that these days. We can bury ourselves in a bottle. We can, we can, blot out reality with all sorts of things, um, including this box that I'm speaking into, you know, and we can avoid all of this. 
for at least four more years. But but the fact, you know, I, I you know, I, I think in the face of extreme circumstances, discomfort is appropriate. And hopefully out of that discomfort, some form of action arises. And and some form, you know, just mindfulness. I'm not a big fan of mindfulness as the concept, as the, the dominant culture kind of theme. But mindfulness as paying attention. When, when the Buddha talked about mindfulness, he was talking about being aware of the consequences of our actions. All our actions have consequences. Everything has consequences. And we can either be oblivious to that or we can be mindful of it. And again, we go to, you know, this, I was just seeing a thing now, but that, you know, to, to partly to your point, we're, we're now taking fertile farmland and using it to plant solar farms. Okay. Well, someday we might be saying, uh oh, <laughs> you know, we needed those crops and we might have found better places, the roofs of apartment buildings and factories and all kinds of places that are doing nothing as, as opposed to places that are creating food, you know? Yeah. So we, it, it's, it, it's to me it's a lot it's like you know as terrifying as it is as uncomfortable it is it, you know we we need to be open it's like it's like preparing for death right nobody wants to like think about and talk about and prepare for their dying but the dying is coming and there's certain things that we need to do we need to be prepared all right and if we just ignore it well, it may not be our problem, but it may be the problem for our our, our relatives and our you know, loved ones that, you know, so we've got to do something, uncomfortable or not, we've got to do something. It reminds me a little bit of uh, there's a there's a guy I watch sometimes when I get a little sick of Zen. Um, I, I like to watch uh, Ajahn Brahm. He's a Theravadan teacher in Australia, uh, student of Ajahn Shah, and um, he often tells a. A story, I guess, would be their version of a koan, or maybe it's a parable about a nun who's meditating in a cave, and you know she's achieved some degree of liberation, and she's sort of left the world, and she's in her cave, and she notices one day that there's a hole in her robe, and uh, so she patches her robe. And then another hole appears and she realizes that the mice are slowly eating away at her robes and she's trying to patch them up. And she says, there must be something I can do to improve my situation. So she goes out to the village and she gets a cat. She brings the cat in and the cat keeps the mice population down. And she says, oh, this is wonderful. Um, no more holes in my robes to patch. I've got a little bit of free time. This is good. Well, of course, the cat needs food. And she goes out. She has to go to the village and starts purchasing food, feed the cat. And then this is, you see, you sort of see where this is going. She ends up to feed the cat. She buys a cow as well. And the cow needs tending to, so she needs a person to look after the cow and um, 
on and on it goes. And I guess maybe the moral of that, which seems to be a lot more straightforward in Theravada, it, it kind of, it, it, it's, they seem to be very much like, okay, no, your first mistake was not accepting that there, you have to mend the holes in your robes. And um, anyway, I just thought I, it, this, uh, this brought that into my mind for some reason. I can't figure out why. Well, this is sort of about chains of causation. Chains of causations exist. Again, nothing exists apart. Everything is part of an infinite number of these chains. And maybe short of going off into a cave and being completely isolated, we have to deal with them. Even this woman in her cave had to deal with them. So again, the question is, how do we interact? She could have gotten a flamethrower and incinerated the mice. She could have gotten dynamite and blown the cave up. Any of these would have been solutions to the mouse problem. So her, her solution of a cat, not so bad relative to many other possibilities. So I, I think it's, you know, that's the thing we want to be careful not to do is kind of uh, create um, false parodies, false e equalities, you know, and, and to some extent we tend to do that. You, you know, if we've got a problem and we have to do something, then let's consider what the least harmful thing is. And if that turns out to be a, not the right strategy, then we need to adapt. You know? But again, I think it's we've got to be there. We've got to be present. We've got to be paying attention. We cannot put our heads in the sand no matter how tempting an option that may be. And we know it's imperfect. We're not going to have any perfect answers. And, and, and maybe the ultimate answer is that Sears Island needs to go because it will save millions of tons of, of carbon into the atmosphere every year. I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. But the, but the fact is, we will constantly have to make hard choices. There are no perfect answers, right? And, and again, we need to be awake. We need to be considering the options. I, I think I just relate to the fact that I think in many cases, the problem is the default position is to do too much and to not think about what we're doing before we do it. We just sort of act. And, and you know, I mean, if you have, um, yeah, I mean, if, if people, people, they mess around uh, too much instead of saying maybe the default position should be to just listen and observe before acting. Um, yeah. Well, sure. And, you know, that we, we don't slow down and we don't consider the alternatives and we don't consider the implications. Look at, we rushed into the development of electric cars. Everybody was saying electric cars are the answer. We've got to get electric cars. Nobody thought about cobalt mines <laughs> and batteries and, and lithium. I don't know what all the things that the heavy metals are that go into, into those batteries. Um, 
you know so now interestingly enough we're abandoning electric cars in many in many in many places you know um and, and thank god they haven't done a lot of destruction it's you know but and and maybe we'll come come to a, a better accommodation and a better way of 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 having it. so but it's exactly what you're saying it's this that's this whole ai situation you know ai is not inherently bad ai is not inherently going to do damage to the planet but human beings that are in a rush without considering the implications to me, that's where the problem lies. And what drives that? Our old friend, greed. There are people who see opportunities to make a billion dollars, and they're not going to slow down on that because of some environmental consequence that's going to happen 10 years down the road. The uh, the, the The thing that makes it really hard you know as somebody who is a technology guy my son is actually has an ai startup company he's making um the 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 the, the problem is that you know you get a variety of people with different motivations and stuff and all you need with something like ai is one person to move at the next step ahead even if 99.9% .9 of the people who know enough about it to do something agree that we should sit back and not do anything until we better understand how to protect ourselves. It only takes one person to move it ahead. And so the result is that it is going to move ahead. There is just no question about it because there is no possible way to stop everybody, every single person who could move it ahead from doing so. And, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> you know I, I don't know what the answer is. It's it's really I mean not only AI but nuclear weapons, biological weapons. Yeah, I mean, so many things can destroy humanity. I I actually started thinking when the drones were heading for Israel yesterday uh, that there was a one percent chance that civilization would be destroyed within the next month. <laughs> that that's where I that's where I ended up going, and now it looks like perhaps we'll get we'll get by this, but it's really really terrifying and, uh, so that's not a very positive <laughs> comment i guess except for um you know there may be solutions that we have no way of foreseeing now to these problems and uh, i do think that spending time and energy cultivating uh, the spiritual and spreading that may help if somebody, if there's somebody out there who will come up with solutions and they are exposed to the spiritual thing from some, through some random person, you know, maybe even one of us, you know, maybe that will help flip a switch in them, which will help them make the step forward, which will save us all. I don't know, but so. Uh, <laughs> Gary, thank you so much. Well, and, and I express, you know, every week I think I want to give a positive talk and every week I fail, <laughs> you know, but because of some of the things that you just alluded to, you know, and we've got so many sort of sociopaths, you know, it's like there's lots of good people doing these things. And then there's the Elon Musks of the world who, you know, are, are a complete crapshoot because they have no interest in the rest of humanity, you know? It, it, so, it, it, you know, but you're right. I think, A, we have to keep working, keep trying. The solution may be something that we cannot see today. And I do think that the more open our minds are, the more opens our hearts are, the more that we're spreading compassion and love, the greatest chance of a positive outcome. Right? No guarantees, but the greatest chance. The minute we shut our hearts down, our minds down, 
the minute we tune out the channel and ignore that we've excluded all those possibilities of a solution. And if any of you saves the world, I will move you forward 20 koans. Thirty, even. I mean, I just would be very generous about that. Okay, this is an exciting moment because I'm about to turn on my water system for the summer. So all winter I've had to not only chop wood but carry water. But now the water will be able to flow through the hose again. I'm very excited. <laughs> Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it.